The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Do revelatory NDEs ex- uh, separate the experiencer from the everyday stresses of everyday life? Does a vision of the other side change our whole perception of what the world is all about? Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. The cultural changes of the 1960s provoked the sense for a time that profound changes were coming to the world. It was hoped by many that love might overcome prejudice and greed and war. Well, it didn't work out yet, did it? Vietnam, Iraq, the Middle East, Afghanistan, starvation and poverty, the rich getting more and more greedy. This is what seems to dominate the world of today. Some near-death experiencers, however, still bring a bigger, more loving perception of existence, and our guest today, Ellen Dye, is one of them. Ellen is an intuitive coach, motivational public speaker, and author. A near-death experience in 1985 expanded her psychic abilities and introduced her to some very loving and humorous guardians of humanity and the ancient wisdom whom she calls the Lion People. They provided her with a vast array of information about life on Earth and the evolution of mankind and opened an ongoing dialogue and collaboration that has grown stronger over time. Ellen publishes a free monthly email newsletter, Tunnel Vision, about the great shift of the ages we are undergoing. She is also the author of the metaphysical fantasy novel, The Search for the Crystal Key, and she is working on a new book, Creating Heaven on Earth, One Soul at a Time, a how-to manual for ushering in the golden age from the perspective of a near-death experience. Ellen, welcome to NDE Radio. Thank you, Lee. I'm delighted to be here. And uh, we're delighted to have you. Uh, Ellen, please tell our listeners about your near-death experience. Well, in 19, it was 1985, and um, I was in a head-on collision in a car. I was going down a road, and there was another car coming the other way, and there was only two cars on the, on the street. And we came up to a, uh intersection with a traffic signal, and it had a a cross street at uh, at a slight angle, not a 45-degree angle. And just as we started to get into the intersection, I noticed that this car was starting to turn left in front of me. Mm-hmm. And it happened so fast that I just had time to think, oh, my God, he's... T- <laughs> and I don't even think I, <laughs> I formed the word turning in my head. And and I have no idea if I even managed to get my foot off the accelerator, let alone get it on the brake. And I didn't feel any impact or anything because the next thing I knew, I was looking down at the top of my car. Mm. And um, from about maybe 20 feet up, 15 to 20 feet up, and it took you know it took me a minute to. <laughs> to reorient myself and figure out what I was looking at. And once I realized I was looking at the top of my car, then I had to think for a minute about, well, what does that mean about who am I that's looking at the car when I know my body's in the car? And um, it was funny because I saw the guy in the other car get out of his and walk over and reach into mine and I thought, oh, he, he's checking to see if I'm okay. And <laughs> instead, he turned my headlights off. <laughs> and <laughs> I, oh no! <laughs> I realized later <laughs> that uh, he was trying to make it look like, you know, it was partly my fault because I was driving without my headlights on. Mm. And uh, but at the at the time, I had no idea why he did that, and I really didn't care because by that point. I thought, you know, there should be there should be a tunnel of light somewhere because I had actually read there were very few books out. There was Raymond Moody's book and I think there was some Bob Monroe had written some of his books <clears throat> about uh, out of body experiences and I had read them and mm-hmm. and I knew 
I'd never had one, but at least I had a mental, you know, model for what was going on. Yes. And I, so I was very lucky. And as soon as I thought there should be a tunnel of light here somewhere, it was as if it just sort of like whomped into, <laughs> you know, <laughs> into existence next to me. And, and I could feel it. And and the cool thing was, is like as soon as I started feeling it, it 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 kind of pulsed, mm. and it pulsed in a way of 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 drawing me in, and and as I felt it, I could feel the energy of this unbelievable love that that I'd never experienced in this life. So there was there was no question whatsoever that I was going through there <laughs> and I mm-hmm. hoped to never come back. <laughs> so I I moved through the tunnel fairly quickly and uh the light just kept getting brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter so that that was by the time I was through it that was all I could see was just this this bright bright light and this and I could feel this pulsing love and this feel of I'm finally home. And and I could feel all of the all of the strain and stress and just everything that wasn't love falling off me. And um I I can't even, you know, I it, it, there are no words to describe this. So anything I say will pale in comparison to the experience. And yes. the next thing I noticed was this this pack of people <laughs> standing around and it was all of my relatives who had who had passed. Oh. And uh yeah, I had had at that point um I had had uh two grandfathers whom I never met while I was alive because they had passed before I was born. I, um, both my grandmothers were gone, um, although I had met them. My mother had died when I was 12, and um, and they were all there, a couple of uncles and aunts, and they were all there, and they all mm. looked fabulous. They all looked... Um, they, they all looked younger than I even remembered them being, and you know, healthy and vibrant. And of course, it's funny because none of us was in a body, <laughs> <laughs> and yet I I saw them as if they had one, you know. And and they mm-hmm. were just so delighted to see me, and I was so delighted to see them. And um, and they were all just doing so well. And and but more, it was it was more that they were there to tell me how much they loved me and how proud they were of me and that that they had, you know, watched over me and been around me, you know, the whole time, even after they had, you know, passed from the physical body. And and oddly enough, I actually saw, I saw relatives and recognized relatives that I had never met, um, and some that I had never even seen pictures of. <laughs> hmm. And I found that out after I came back. But And I actually, we dug and found some pictures. But um, after it seemed like I had talked to them forever, because there's no time there, I thought, I had this feeling that I was supposed to go, I wasn't there to see them, although that was fantastic, but I was supposed to talk to somebody else, and I didn't know who it was or or how I would find them. Mm-hmm. And and about that time, I thought, you know, it's really weird just being here in this bright light. And, and even though I don't have any eyes or anything, I'd, I'd like to have something that seems familiar. And as soon as I thought that everything changed into this kind of park-like setting. And hmm. it's like, oh, okay, yeah, I can relate to this. <laughs> and, <laughs> except every, all the colors were amazing. I mean, you, you know, the grass was a green 
that I've never seen before. The flowers were colors that I've never seen before. They were all, and they were all alive. They were so alive. It's like you could just feel them being alive. And the, and the trees were, were magnificent and there were birds and, and looked like a sky. I mean, it looked familiar except everything was, you know, on steroids because <laughs> everything <laughs> was just so vibrant. And, and the, the coolest, one of the coolest things for me was that the sound I heard, you know, everybody thinks of heaven and thinks of angels with harps and things. And, you know, people hear different, different things in their experience. And the thing that I heard was children laughing. And there were children running all over the place, just squealing with delight. And, and, and that to me is the sound of home. That's the sound of heaven to me is laughter, just joyous laughter. And um, so I saw this little path and I walked down it and over this little bridge over a little stream. It was just, it was just beautiful. And, and suddenly I found myself standing in a clearing and there were about 12 very, very tall beings of light standing around me in a circle. And they were all about 12 or 15 feet tall. And I'm 5'4". <laughs> I'm like, whoa! <laughs> And you would think that would be intimidating, but it wasn't because the there was already so much love in that place. But these beings emanated just an incredible. It it was it was phenomenal the 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 love that they wrapped around me, and it was the closest I can ever come to describing it is that they they saw me. They saw every bit of me. They saw every thought, every emotion, every action that I'd ever had in this life or any other life. And by that time, I also knew pretty much that I'd probably done it all, you know. (laughs) I'm one of those who subscribes to the idea that, you know, we've all been saints and we've all been serial killers at some point (laughs) in our evolution. So I had, I had no, um, no thoughts that I had always been a good girl or something in, in every life, but they saw every, everything and they loved every bit of it. The good, what I would call the good, the bad, and the ugly, warts and all, they loved every part of me. It was they saw it all, they accepted it all, and they loved it all, and they embraced it all, and and that just it just infused me with this total love and total self acceptance that no matter how harshly I had judged myself, nobody there was ever going to judge me. They were just going to love me no matter what. And you know, oddly enough, that was kind of painful <laughs> because I think we don't, we don't get that here. <laughs> and no. and I almost, it, was, it was almost like, oh, okay, I have to, I have to go now because this is, <laughs> this is too hard, <laughs> you know, to have everything everything about me totally accepted and loved by these beings that were just so so just so loving that was that was everything about them was love and and we i feel like we stood there for about 4 centuries <laughs> <laughs> and and they they told me everything they showed me everything. They showed me all the universes. They showed me the whole history of humanity and, and why we're here and, and what we're accomplishing and, and how it's going to play out. And, you know, every time I had a question and I'd say, but, but really, I mean, you haven't been down there lately, have you? <laughs> you know, it's nasty. 
And, and, you know, and they'd show me why it was the way it was. And, and, you know, they told, they told me everything. And the coolest part was part of me kept thinking, Oh, I remember that. Oh yeah. I knew that. I remember that. And it, and it, it really, um, showed me that, that in my essence, in my soul, in my spirit, I, I knew, I knew it all. I had all the answers. And, and we, we have that with us, but we forget it when we're in a body. And so it was as if they download, or either they downloaded all of this stuff, or it was already there and they put it in nice little files in my head, you know, so I wouldn't, so that I'd be able to access them again. And they showed me where the file drawer in my head was. And at some point, I said, uh, well, you know, I'm not going back there and you can't make me. <laughs> and I remember I was like, my head was way back because they were so tall and I'm shaking my forefinger at them and I'm going, and you can't make me because it's so nasty there. And people are so mean and there is no love on that planet whatsoever. It's like. There just isn't any. We talk about love and we say we have love, but it is nothing like what's here. And now that I finally figured out where I belong, I'm staying. And you're not making me go. And they're all, and it, it, it sort of felt like I was arguing, but they weren't arguing with me. They were just going, yes, dear, you can do whatever you want because you are a divine, powerful being and you have free will. You can stay or you can go back. And I'm like, oh, okay, good. Now that we got that cleared up. And, and then they said, but let us just remind you why you decided to have this life before you decide. And then I woke up in the emergency room <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> What happened? And this nurse, lovely nurse comes over and says, you were in a car accident, dear. And I said, <laughs> I know, but I'm not supposed to be here. She said, well, you're in the emergency room because you were in a car accident. Do you understand that? I said, yes, I totally understand that part, but I'm not supposed to be here. <laughs> <laughs> they said, well, you, you have a severe concussion and, and a number of other injuries and, and, you know, you'll be here for a little while, but we'll take care of you. It's okay. And I'm like, that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> And and I was I was one of those. I know there are some people who have NDEs who, from that moment on, they're like I I was delighted to be alive, and I lived every moment to the max, you know, loving being alive on Earth. And I am not one of those people because I I got severely depressed <laughs> for mm. a long time. I mean, I would I would wake up in the morning and pray to, or, you know, go to bed at night and pray to die, and I'd wake up in the morning and go, oh. Crap, I'm still here. And mm. <laughs> that went on for a long time. And, of course, it, because, because your whole experience has changed, everything in your life changes. Your, because your perspective on everything changes. The things that you thought were important don't seem important anymore. And, you know, the people around you think, you know, don't understand why you've changed or, you know, if they can hear your story at all, um, they think it's cool, but they don't want you to change. And, you know, so you lose friends and all this other stuff. But, you know, at some point, I think I just figured praying to die every night isn't working, so I might as well snap out of it. <laughs> so. Well, Ellen, they, uh, you said that they told you why things are or the way they are down here. Do you remember wh why things are the way they are? Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, they well, one of the, one of the things they did tell me, and I want to be sure I get this in, based on especially based on your introduction, is that one they showed me the golden age of humanity. They showed me what that looks like of people working together, and there's no lack, and there's no limitation. And everybody has 
what they need to thrive, not just survive, but to thrive and be creative. And, and, and everybody has what they need and, and everybody's happy and works together in collaboration. And, and, and it was like, oh, wow, I, I wish I could live during those times. And of course, later I thought, well, what were they just doing the na 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 thing that you know you're never going to see that? <laughs> mm. Mm. And but but of course I know now that that no, that they weren't doing that. But but what they told me, and of course you don't remember all of it when you come back. For me, it's like one of those file folders opens when I need to have it open when I need the information in there. And so over time, since 85, a lot of those file folders have opened for me. And, you know, it, my understanding is that we, we are here. We volunteered for this. It's kind of like we're playing a game. It's, we're, we're playing blind man's buff. We decided, uh, a group of us, that it would be really cool to experience separation from source or the perception of separation from source. Mm-hmm. And and that let's go play that game, and let's see how long it takes us to remember who we are. And come on, this will be fun. And we're like, yeah, okay, let's go do it because we're pretty bored with you know everything's beautiful, everything's loving, we're all one, <laughs> you know. <laughs> mm. And I guess we were the restless, the rebellious types or something, and we thought this would be a good idea. Yeah, it, you know, we thought it would be a good idea at the time, but but I think, you know, we or or you could use the play analogy, which I also like. We we all signed on as this acting troupe to be in a play. Mm. And we've gone from, I, like, city to city being in this play, and we're all method actors. That's the problem. We're such good actors. We have started to believe that the characters, the roles that we're playing – are who we are. And and but the but the reason for it was to experience it's like what would it be like to experience things in a in a physical body where you had sensory input and you forgot that you were all one and you thought that you were separate and you had to make choices based on those understandings. And, um, you know, what could you experience? And, and we wanted to experience all of it, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We wanted to experience it all because partly it helps us define, just like in this life, when something bad, something that we don't like happens, we say, oh, I don't like that. I'm not doing it again. When something good happens, we go, oh, yes, I'd like some more of this, please, you know. And and it was a, we wanted to experience that. We wanted to try it out. We wanted to see what duality felt like. And I have a friend, I have a friend who believes that, uh, that we're actually the fallen angels, that we, uh, out of ego, opted to separate ourselves from God and came down to earth and created what we've got here and that we have to earn our way back. But you don't have that same uh, feeling, do you? Well, I don't have the, I don't have the feeling of, of having to earn uh, because, again, there's judgment there. And, and mm-hmm. one, of, one of the biggest things that I learned, and, and this was one that has stuck with me on a deep, deep level is that humans are the only ones who judge. Hmm. God does not judge. The parable of the prodigal son. Did the one who came home get judged by his father? No. We, we are not judged. You know, God is is like, well, okay, the kids are still out there playing, you know. <laughs> when they get tired of that, they'll come home, you know. And, you know, in the meantime, let's set up the feast. <laughs> and that's, there's no judgment. There's no that's judgment. Right. We're part of God. God doesn't judge itself. Mm. We're part I of recently, God. We are all part of God, every single one of us. 
And it has nothing to do with what we do. I mean, if, again, using the play analogy, if we're all in a play, in a play, in order to have drama, you got to have the good guys and the bad guys. And I think through reincarnation, we change roles. You know, it's like, okay, in, in, New, in the New York show, I was Ophelia. And in Chicago, I want to play Hamlet, you know. <laughs> and we get to experience it all. But there's no, we're the only ones who judge that. I recently saw the, the movie Heaven is for Real. I did. And uh, yeah, noticed how dysfunctional the boy's family and the church congregation were with the notion of an NDE, and it's really only the child himself seemed to have the ability to integrate the reality of this world and the next. Do you suppose that's what uh, Jesus meant when he said we must turn and be like little children? Oh, I, I think in a lot of ways, yes, that that we we have to put away that that for ourselves also the the you know the the sophistication that we have, you know, draped ourselves in, the the cynicism that we have draped ourselves in. And and the the children the children can teach us that. It's it's to be childlike again rather than childish. And and yes. to to see the wonder and to understand the magic that's in the air, the magic that we are, the magic of everything. And he just, yeah, it's like, hey, I had this experience and this is what happened. No biggie. You know, it's like, yeah, I talked mm-hmm. to Jesus. I sat on his lap. It's like, well, of course. And it's only our patient <laughs> and that, you know, we are worldwide now and no one will fool us. You know, it's, it's that it's that thing that we've placed on ourselves that keeps us from experiencing the the magic because it's here it's just a if we can get into get away from that mindset and into the mindset of seeing seeing the wonder and the magic and and that's all around us so when do we get to see our golden age well i i think we're working on it i mean you know probably everybody's heard about the shift of the ages and Mm. um that's that's Starting now, in the 60s, we sang, it's the dawning of the age of Aquarius. And I've done a lot of studying on the, you know, what the Mayan calendar was about and, and this whole uh, shift of the ages. And this right now, we're uh, in the middle of a big transformational cycle of Uranus squaring Pluto, and which started back in the 60s with the Uranus-Pluto conjunction. And we're in the process of bringing it. And I do think it's important for us to have that shift of consciousness. I know people tend to look out in the world and say, oh, my God, it's going to hell in a handcart and everything's getting worse and worse and worse. But, but you know, that's just where you're focusing your attention. And if you focus your attention on all of the fabulous, amazing things that are going on, the, you know, the, the random acts of kindness, the... Um, the technology, there's all of these kids who are like, you know, under 30, <laughs> I say kids, you know, under 25, <laughs> and they're teens who are coming up with, you know, tests, tests for pancreatic cancer, <laughs> or mm. a 19 year old invented this array thing to use out in the oceans to clear, to, to, to clear out the the plastic bottles that are polluting the oceans, and oh, that would be terrific. There's so much going on, <laughs> and it you yeah. know it it depends on where you want to focus your attention. Do you want to focus on you know the the decline, <laughs> or do you want to <laughs> focus on the shift? Really, is here and it's coming in, and it's getting stronger. Ellen? And I'm sorry, know, we're shifted my Ellen. awareness. I could see it, and it's like, wow, this is so exciting. <laughs> Alan, we're just about out of time. <laughs> uh, maybe <laughs> I know it's flown by. Perhaps you could tell our listeners how they can stay in touch with you. Uh, give them your website. Oh, I will. Um, my website is www.lionmagic.com. L-I-O-N, like the animal, and magic, M-A-G-I-C. Um, and I please come and and look at my uh, my Tunnel Vision newsletter. It's free. Okay. Sign up. <laughs>
Very well, good. We'll visit. Well, it looks like we are out of time for today, but I want to thank our guest, Ellen Dye, for sharing about her NDE and what it all means for us. And you can find out more about Ellen and her NDE and her work at, as she said, www.lionmagic.com. If you'd like to listen to this show again or any other of our programs, please visit our website at nderadio.org. And for more information about, about IANS, please check that website at iands.org. There will be information on that site about our upcoming Labor Day weekend conference on NDE's health and healing in Newport Beach, California, from August 28th through the 31st. So save those dates, and thanks for listening. <laughs>